Uh, at this point, we go into what we call our community moment. It's a time where someone from the community gets up and shares um, kind of a thought for the day. A lot of times it's your journey to free thought. Sometimes it's uh, something about a book you've read or a movie you've seen or some idea you've been working through. Um, if you'd like to do a community moment, please get with me, Mike Alice, and uh, my email is mike at houstonoasis.org. I'd love to get you on the calendar. Um, we love hearing kind of a, just a huge, diverse um, range of messages during our community moments. And today, we are welcoming one of our um, almost original members there right from the get-go, and kind of the head of our sound endeavors up here, um, our good friend Fred Thompson is gonna come talk to us about authentic happiness. Let's welcome Fred. This is a learning process, and we're learning how to use this new equipment. <laughs> Sarah, I'll move this back for you. Don't look worried. Okay, we're starting to see the search for meaning. One of our Oasis values is meaning comes from making a difference. And in my opinion, what I'm going to talk about today is really part of our human search for meaning. Let's see if this works. Yes, this is a review of a book entitled Authentic Happiness by Martin Seligman. Uh, Seligman is a university psychology, oops, get out from in front of that speaker, university psychology professor. He is a prolific author. He is a former president of the American Psychological Association, and he is viewed as the father of the positive psychology movement in America. Uh, the desired outcome of this, unfortunately, I can't give you the key to happiness in 15 minutes. Oh. So I'm, gonna, I'm sorry, Johnny, but what I'm going to give you is just enough information to decide whether you want to learn more about this book. I ask that you hold questions to the end, specifically to the end of the session today, not to the end of this, because I'm going to take all 15 minutes and I don't want to encroach on Sarah's time. Uh, so Legman, very early in the book, starts to talk about how 20th century psychology lost its way. And he points out that during the time period between the end of World War II and about the 1970s, if you took a look at, randomly looked at any hundred papers that were published in peer-reviewed psychology journals, 99 of them would be about unhappiness. Nobody ever worried about happiness. And he was curious about, oh, and I should mention psychology, the social science of psychology, and the medical science of psychiatry, together with Big Pharma, were very successful in identifying, defining, and identifying about 20 psychological disorders and coming up with effective treatment for about a dozen of them. So depression, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, all are treatable today. And, uh, and that's an important achievement, but at the same time, nobody gave any thought to what about happy people? More than 90% of the people in the U.S. at any one time are not suffering from a psychological disorder of any type. And some questions come up about that. Why are some people happier than others? Nobody knew. Everybody had ideas, but nobody knew. So he set out to research this, and he was very fortunate. He had an army of slaves to do the work from. We don't call them slaves. We call them Graduate assistants, yes. And the rest of this talk today is about what does the research, what does his research and other research tell us? He identifies three factors that affect happiness. The first is your immediate life circumstances, which I'm gonna discuss initially, and then what he calls your set range and factors that are under your voluntary control. Uh, some of the immediate life circumstances that affect people's happiness are money, health, marriage, political affiliation, social networks, pets, and religion, and not so much these bottom ones. And some research has been done. In fact, I want to show you some research results on money, marriage, and religion. Uh, this is research done by the Pew Research Center. They did a very comprehensive study of happiness in 2005. And, and they uh, surveyed thousands of Americans, and it was a very diverse cross-cut 
of the American population. So let's look at money. Here are their findings on money, and you can't read this, but I'll tell you. For people who earn less than 30000 a year, 29% claimed to be very happy. For people who earn more than 100000 a year, that number jumps up to 49%. So as there is some correlation between money and happiness. You've heard money can't buy you happiness. Well, that may be true because this is correlation. It doesn't necessarily mean causation. After all, we all try to be critical thinkers in here, and we just don't jump to conclusions. Marriage. 43% of the married people said they were happy versus only, I can't read that, but I think it's 29% of the people who are not married. <laughs> Frequent churchgoers are happier. 43% of the people who attend religious services at least once a week claim to be very happy versus only 26% of those who seldom or never set foot in a church. Interesting, and we will come back to that a bit later. In fact, in the... In the next graph, I put an asterisk by religion because I am going to come back to that and talk about the significance of that for Houston Oasis. And now it's time for a pop quiz just to be sure you're paying attention. I'm going to show you two scenarios and I'm going to ask everyone to indicate by a show of hands whether you would choose scenario one or scenario two, which you think would make you more happy. And don't, don't try to overanalyze this. Just go with your gut feeling. Okay, scenario one, congratulations. You are the winner of a $190 million Mega Millions. No, you can't vote yet. You have to see number two. It could be better, you don't know. Okay, number two, you got T-boned by an uninsured motorist and you're lying in hospital bed in excruciating pain and the doctors tell you you'll never walk again. So how many people choose scenario one? Okay, how many do I have for scenario two? Okay, you guys weren't born yesterday, were you? You do understand, and it's intuitively obvious that given those two choices, heck, I would rather be in church right now. Yeah, that's the choice. But you're thinking only in terms of the short range. Because the second factor that contributes, that influences your happiness is what Sligman calls your set range. And let me explain that. Think of a scale from zero to 10, where zero is neutral. You're neither happy nor un unhappy nor happy. And 10 is just happy, happy, happy as can be. Seligman so says his research revealed that we all fall within a set range on that scale and that range is biologically determined. There's nothing we can do about it. Now, let me give you an example of one of the studies that led him to that conclusion. It was a study of adults who had been adopted as infants or small children and who, as adults, had learned the identity of their biological parents. So Seligman's slave population studied those individuals their adoptive parents and their biological parents. And what they discovered is there is a much coral closer correlation to the individual's happiness with their biological parents than with their adoptive parents. So that's his conclusion about that. Sligman also says this is far more important than your life circumstances. It really doesn't matter whether you won the lottery last week or you got T-boned by the uninsured motorist. In, the, in two years, you're gonna be about as happy as unhappy or unhappy as you were before. And this is borne out by many research data sets. That's just the way it is. I don't know if I believe his research, but that's what his research tells him. And of course, your set range will pull you back toward your own equilibrium point. And some people are higher, their set range is higher than others. Some people may hover around a seven, eight, or a nine. Others may hover around a two, three, or a four. Not everybody is equally happy. For example, I don't know if smiling is an indication of happiness, but has anyone in here ever seen a picture of Ralph Nader smiling? Oh. Google Ralph Nader, go find one. How about Don Imus? I did find one of Don Imus out of hundreds, but he had a topless woman sitting in his lap at the time, and I don't think it was a happy smile. I think it was a very nervous smile. What am I doing here with all these photographers? Um, <laughs> the third factor, which is most important, is things that are under your voluntary control. 
And he started with an assumption, a, a hypothesis. Virtuous people seem to be more happy. Good people seem to be happier than bad people. People who do good things are happier than people who do bad things. But how do you test that? So he did a study of many cultures looking for what he called ubiquitous values and character strengths. And he studied, and I need to pull this here. Oh, he studied ancient Greek and Roman cultures. He studied Native American cultures. He studied postmodern 21st century American values, 19th century Calvinist values. Let me just go to the next slide here. Seventh generation Klingon culture. <laughs> That's a joke, but he says he studied it. To give you an idea of what he found, let me point out some non ubiquitous values from these cultures. Postmodern 21st century America, un unwarranted self esteem, good looks, assertiveness, autonomy, uniqueness, wealth, and competitiveness. He says Plato and Aristotle would be horrified by some of these values, yet we think they're great. 19th century Calvinist values, perfection, chastity is not, a, is not a ubiquitous value through all cultures, and for women, submissiveness and silence. By the way, that is not a Houston Oasis value, so it's non-ubiquitous. For uh, seventh generation Klingon culture, and it just so happens uh, Old Testament culture, vengeance. Vengeance is not a ubiquitous value. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Well, you're not behaving very well when you do vengeance. Sorry. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and he identified six values that are ubiquitous. They're found in all cultures. These are things that are admired within those cultures, and they're admired for themselves, not because of what they produce. And those are wisdom and knowledge, courage, love and humanity, justice, temperance, and spirituality, and transcendence. Okay, by themselves, I find it hard to get my head around that. But he identified character strengths within each of these. For example, if you were practicing wisdom and knowledge, what character strengths would you be displaying? And he identified 24 character strengths, and obviously we don't have time to go through 24 character strengths, but I'll show you some of them. I'll show you the character strengths that come under wisdom and knowledge, and the ones that come under spirituality and transcendence. <clears throat> and under wisdom and knowledge, curiosity, interest in the world, love of learning, critical thinking, originality, practical intelligence, social, emotion, in other words, people intelligence, you understand pe people, and perspective, meaning you can see the big picture and how things fit into it. Under spirituality and transcendence, appreciation of beauty, gratitude, hope and optimism, spirituality or religiousness, forgiveness and mercy, playfulness and humor, and passion and enthusiasm. Okay, I've been talking about this religious thing now. Uh, so what's the significance of the spirituality and religious virtue for free thinkers? I'll tell you what Seligman said about it, because he is a researcher, and wherever the research leads him, that's what he's going to publish, whether he agrees with it or not. But he does agree with this, in spite of the fact that he is an atheist. Here's a quote from an interview. The interviewer said, you speak in your book about faith and spirituality. What role do they play in happiness? And his answer is, quite a number of roles. First. There's been evidence for a long time that people who are seriously religious are less depressed and happier and more optimistic. Secondly, people who are seriously religious are at a tremendous advantage with the third kind of happy life, the meaningful life. They use their signature strengths in the service of something much larger than they are, and that is a tried and true route to life satisfaction. Now listen very carefully to this next sentence. But part of my concern is the enormous number of people who, like myself, have no religious beliefs, yet want to lead a meaningful life. He hadn't heard of Houston Oasis because yeah. he wrote this book in 2005 and we hadn't been invented. But we're exactly what Seligman is looking for. And now, let's go to the author's conclusions. First of all, we're not all the same. Of those 24 character strengths, each person has their own pattern 
of signature strengths in some areas where, frankly, you're kind of weak. That's just the way it is. We're not the same. Two people might be equally effective, but there can be very different people that bring very different strengths to the table. The research results indicate that your life circumstances play a minor role in your happiness and sense of fulfillment. Well, I'd rather be the lottery winner than the guy that got T-boned by the uninsured driver, but it really doesn't matter in the long haul. Second, you will stay within your set range most of the time. You do drop out of it temporarily if you, you're hurrying to get to that meeting so you can be prepared and there's a major traffic jam and you're stuck on the highway, you're going to get out of your set range, but just for a few minutes, you'll get back into it wherever it is. You can embrace, enhance your happiness by finding situations that enable you to use your signature strengths. And it's more productive, and I didn't realize this, to improve your strengths than to try to overcome your weaknesses. And what do we do every year? We make New Year's resolutions to overcome our most significant weaknesses and nothing ever happens. He suggests you work on your strengths. And if your strengths don't fit your life situation, change your life situation. Change your career if you have to. That's the only, that's the way to happiness. <clears throat> How much time do I have, Mike? Because I can skip this part. Yeah, Okay. <laughs> can you do another one? Can you save it for another? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just. Yeah. We have time for Sarah. Yeah. Okay. Let me just conclude now. Interesting stuff. Okay. But what can I do with it? Some next steps. Obviously, you can do nothing, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Not everybody's interested in this sort of thing. You can visit the Authentic Happiness website, and all you need to do is Google Authentic Happiness and you'll find it. On the website, you can complete a survey of character strengths questionnaire, and it will rank your strengths from the highest to the lowest. Personal opinion, that's really pretty useless if that's all you do. You can read the book. The book is available from Amazon anywhere for, I think, $12 for a new one down to 97 cents for a used one. Or you can engage in a discussion, and I'll post something on our web page about whether there's any interest in following this up with a discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.